in Matthew 24, by the way, right here where Jesus, this church where Jesus wept over the city, this church where we remember Jesus looking across the Kidron Valley and looking at the temples and describing the end of days, Matthew 24, his longest teaching on eschatology, Bible prophecy, end of days, the signs of the times, whatever you like to call it, every bit of Matthew 24 is what we see as the framework of the book of Revelation. It's fascinating. Matthew 24 becomes the outline that Jesus uses when he shows John, the apostle, on the island of Patmos, all the events of the future. Now, here's, here's the whole sermon Jesus gave in Matthew 24, the verse numbers, 4 and 5, 68, etc. And what Jesus said is going to be the indication of how to know we're at the end. First, he said, Satan's deceptions will grow. That's verses four and five. Then six to eight, earth's disasters will grow. Remember all the pestilence and nation against nation and war and earthquakes and all that, disasters. Persecution of saints will grow. And he talks about that, about how people will betray one another and parents and children. Number four, darkness and evil will grow. That's what it says in 12 and 13. Verse 14, now here's a hopeful one the spread of the gospel will grow. He says, the gospel will be preached in all the world. The whole world will be blanketed during the tribulation with the good news. Then number six, Satan's plan that he's always had to visibly rule the world through the Antichrist will grow. So the, the signs of the end is gonna be a preparation for the launch of Satan's man. Satan incarnated, we could say, as the false Christ. Satan coming in a man to be the Jesus that the whole world accepts. The real Jesus, the whole world rejects. The false Jesus, the whole world puts out their arms and accepts. That's what verses 15 to 20 in his sermon talk about. And then 27 to 31, God the Son will return and end the rule of sin and take over and sit and fulfill all the promises of the Old Testament and sit on the throne of David and et cetera, et cetera. Now look what I wrote in red. The blue is Matthew 24. The red, the framework of Revelation. Now this is just, I, I teach Revelation regularly and uh, it usually takes 20 hours to go through the book of Revelation, okay? And at the end, I'm gonna to talk to you about that and encourage you with something. but. Just briefly, an outline, the framework of Revelation is Satan's deceptions. That's Revelation 6, 1 and 2. That's the first time they're talked about. Earth's disasters, that starts in Revelation 6, 3, goes through verse 17 and on and on and on. Persecution's growing. That's also in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, darkness and evil will grow. That's Revelation 9. Remember when the pit opens and the, the demon hordes come out and, and are just torching tormenting actually people on earth. And then the spread of the gospel. Jesus launches his 144,000 evangelists. Jesus uh, has his two witnesses going throughout preaching. And in chapter 14, not only are the 144,000 working, but the angel preaches the gospel in verse six to the whole world. And so that's the spread of the gospel. And then Satan's plan, it starts in chapter six, it continues with the actual uh, description of the Antichrist in Revelation 13, what he does with religion in Revelation 17, how he is at work in materialism in Revelation 18, and then look at this, Revelation 19 to 22, the return of Christ. So Matthew 24 preached at Dominus Flevit, taught actually by Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 24, is the framework of Revelation. Wow, what a week we're gonna have, okay? But let's look at the slides. Jerusalem is God's countdown clock for humanity's survival. When Jesus told his disciples and us about the future, he built every word of it around one spot on earth. In theological circles, this message, which is Matthew 24, repeated in Mark 13 and Luke 21, 
is called the Olivet Discourse. That's, that's the way theologians refer to this part of Jesus' ministry. But Jesus framed his words about the rest of history, the history of this planet, by the sight of Jerusalem and all of its earthly glory spread out before him. And if you look again at Christ's words in Matthew 24, all that he says about his second coming, everything is introduced as he said, keep your eye on Jerusalem. He said, I'm ascending from the Mount of Olives, which is at the center of Jerusalem then and now, and I'm returning to the Mount of Olives. Everything about the final moments of human history are tied to Jerusalem. Now, if you are at the Dome of the Rock, remember how many times I've circled the Golden Dome? Well, actually, I'm standing right now on the platform where the Dome of the Rock is with the stairway that leads down from the Dome of the Rock to the Eastern Gate. And look what you can see if you look carefully. First of all, this is the Church of the Ascension. We've always talked about that. That's where Jesus ascended back to heaven. And by the way, that's where he's coming back in the second coming to touch the Mount of Olives. This is the Russian Orthodox Church of Gethsemane. Now, below it, you can't see it, is the Roman Catholic Church, the one that, that uh, was our lesson when we were doing Gethsemane. But look what's right here. That's our site number 42. That is Dominus Flevit. That's the tear-shaped dome of this church. And look what's right beside it, right here. Do you see this? That's the Palm Sunday Road going up over the Mount of Olives to Bethphage and then to Bethany. So when you stand at the Dome of the Rock, that's where we are, where this picture was taken, this is the view Jesus had when he started Matthew 24 because they were walking around all the buildings of the temple and he was looking out at the Mount of Olives before he left the temple and went over right here to this spot on the side of the mountain. Now, as you look out, here again is that cross and the golden dome and the rest. This is the rest of that beautiful window that's in Dominus Flevit. But the reason I pause here is God has picked Jerusalem as his city. That's something we need to underline in our mind. And to God, Jerusalem is the center of all Bible prophecy for the universe. It's totally the liberation of the sin that permeates the universe. See, that's why stars are exploding and dying and, and there are you know, asteroid belts and, and solar flares and everything else that's showing everything's winding down. It's because of sin. Sin makes the whole universe, it says in Romans chapter 8, makes the whole universe groan because everything is disintegrating. Disintegrating. Here in my Bible, look at Matthew 23, starting in verse 37. This is, and I'm going to show you this in our 250 events chart, how this ties in with all the other parallel synoptic passages. But Jesus laments over Jerusalem. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills prophets and stones those who are sent to her. I wanted to gather you together, but you were not willing. So your house has left you desolate and you will see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, that's Zechariah 12 to 14. Then when Jesus got all done with that, he went out and departed from the temple. And as he's leaving, the disciples showed him the buildings of the temple. So they're walking out and they're just marveling at how amazing all of it is. Then... See what I wrote right here? They went from the temple, all of this, Jesus said actually standing up on the temple mount. Then they go to the Mount of Olives because look at verse three, as he sat on the Mount of Olives. Now, when you read the parallel passages, it's very clear that Jesus stated all this, not one stone on the temple mount and then walks to Mount of Olives. And then starting in verse three, sitting on the Mount of Olives, he gives this entire sermon that I just outlined for you. Now look up here again in verses four and five, the deception, the disasters, the persecution, the darkness, the spread of the gospel, Satan's plan, and God's son returning. Now look and let me show you these verses four and five. 
don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. That's the deceptions. Here's the disasters. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. Now look up for just a second. In the parallel passages, Luke chapter 21 adds this. He said, not only are there going to be disasters, but this is what he says. And I can just see it. He said, men's hearts will fail them when they see the raging of the waves and all of these weather disasters and when they see what's going on with the earthquakes. How do people see disasters all around the world so vividly that it scares them and they, and, and here I'll write down the word, it's very interesting. The word that Luke uses is apsuko. And uh, what, what that is, is the alpha privative on suke. This is what we call psychology, psychiatry, the human spirit. And ah means no. So they have no spirit. What is going to happen is, Luke says, and, and we can now see it. I'm holding my, my cell phone and I'm going to be watching on Facebook Live as if I was in the tribulation uh, and not raptured, if I was still on earth and an unsaved person, I'm watching on Facebook Live and all of a sudden I see a tidal wave and it just totally destroys Honolulu. A drone is footage is coming through and I go, and just then there's an earthquake where I am. And what will happen is Jesus said, people will drop dead during this time period. They will upsuko. Their life will leave them because of the disasters that they're watching happening around the world, which is one of the evidences that we're in the last times. When could people see everything happening around the world until the last few years since the advent of basically the iPhone in 2007, where everyone had a computer attached to everything else in their pocket that they watch videos on? and everything else. Okay, back to the scriptures. That's the disasters. Then we get back to more false prophets. But look at this. Here's the gospel and kingdom. Oh, and here's the persecution. I left that out in verse 9. They will deliver you up and kill you and you'll be hated and many will be offended. They will betray one another. So there's the persecution. Um, there's the evil. Lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. But look, here's the positive, verse 14, the gospel will be preached to all nations. And then look, here's the rise of the Antichrist when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place. And on and on it goes until we get to the coming of Christ. Immediately after the tribulation, the sign of the Son of Man will appear. He'll send his angels at the sound of a trumpet. So that's Matthew 24. Now look at the slide. Again, looking from, we're standing between the cedar trees and the olive trees of Dominus Flevit, looking at the Dome of the Rock, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and even David's Citadel, Pilate's Palace, Herod's Palace, right over there. Such a vantage point. But all this to say Jerusalem is big in God's word. It's the most mentioned place in the Bible. It's the center of the prophetic universe. It's the city, look at this, God chose for himself. 1 Kings eleven thirteen for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. 1136, Jerusalem, the city I've chosen for myself to put my name there. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times in God's word. Plus Zion is mentioned, Mount Zion, 160 times in the city of David, 46 times. You add that together, this is the most important place mentioned in the Bible. That's where God promised the Lamb of God to Abraham. That's where David was promised a future kingdom for his, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And it's where Jesus was crucified for our redemption. But not only first in my journal, I put it was a place of so much ministry and I just showed you all those places. It's also the place where Jesus sorrowed as he described the end of the world. Christ's judgments come to those who are unwilling to come to him. That's what he said in Matthew 23 when he was weeping. The chief characteristic of the end of days is Christ's most frequent warning. 
Beware of all Satan's forms of deception. Remember it says, do not be deceived in Matthew 24, 4, 5, 11, and 24. As the end of day's map, Jesus explains to his disciples in the synoptics here, God's wrath against sin and love for lost sinners unfolds and is seen through the seals. Those are the decrees of God that, that are listed in Revelation 6. Through the trumpets, those are the announcements of God. And then the bowls, which are his stored up wrath that Revelation details. Matthew 24 has these seven basic elements we see as the framework of Revelation. And here, and, and for those of you that, that want this chart, here I'll hold it before I scribble on it so you can screenshot it. Jesus explains Satan's many deceptions. And, and the characteristic of Matthew 24 is all of these elements will grow. They're like birth pangs. They start and then they get intensified and stronger and stronger and stronger. Deceptions, disasters, persecution, darkness, spread of the gospel, the rise of the Antichrist, the return of the Son to end the rule of sin. All of that from right here, right where you could see the entire Temple Mount and right next to where Jesus ascended and descended in the second coming that he described. Jerusalem is God's clock. The close of world history is tied to this little city. All the world will focus on Jerusalem as the wrath of God is poured out in the tribulation. Fall in human history culminates with Jesus Christ's descent to the top of the Mount of Olives when the Creator returns to Jerusalem to restore his fallen paradise. One of the amazing um, prophetic books is Zechariah 14. Verse 2 says, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. This is the tribulation and the return of Christ. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem. You can see that, can't you, in your mind? And look what happens. The Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. Guess what? This is, interestingly enough, an, a place where the fault lines are mapped out in this Atlas of Israel, the 1985 version, page 17. I just took a picture of it. This is the old city, the temple, the Dome of the Rock. Uh, this is the Mount of Olives. And geologists have found there's actually an east to west fault line exactly right there. In fact, this map was sent to me by a dear friend of mine from California that was in a class that I taught uh, when, when Bonnie and I ministered out at Grace Community Church. And he was a geologist and he had this and he sent this to me showing that exactly what Zechariah 14 says you can see on the fault line maps. Isn't that interesting? This reminds me of something. And take a minute and look up here. I want to show you. Uh, this resource, Living Hope for the End of Days. Now, when you go to Matthew 24, look at this. Jesus wants us living in hope as the world disintegrates. And Jesus outlines the rest of human history in Matthew 24. Let me show you how to use this resource. And I just want to read to you a few of the parts of Living Hope. The first, by the way, this is my dissertation when I got my doctorate at Dallas Seminary. And when I got done with my dissertation, it was published. A dear friend of mine uh, in Tulsa has a publishing company. And he took my dissertation and said, I would like to help you make this a daily devotional. And so this is, lined, is designed to be a 365-day, 12-month, 52-week journey through the book of Revelation. And it takes five minutes a day to read. So, so, for example, the third week, it says signs that were near the end. This is week three of Living Hope. Prophecy by the numbers. When Jesus walked on earth, he announced to his disciples his coming was near. And while studying a series I was preparing called What's Next, I began examining how much God has left for us to know about the events yet to come. In reading J. Barton's Payne series of numbers regarding, uh, regarding prophecy, it was quite enlightening. Basically, I read a theologian who took every prophecy in the Bible, 
all the 2,000 prophetic scriptures and he put them into categories. And this is what he said. All the Bible has a total of 31,103 verses, 8,352 of them are prophetic. They can be grouped into 737 different predictions. Of the 8,352 verses, 6,312 have already happened. That leaves 215 specific predictions in 2,040 verses yet to be fulfilled. Wow. You ever want to study biblical prophecy? The third chapter analyzes every prophecy in the Bible, divides them into the, the signs of Christ's return. That's on Monday of week three. The signs of Christ's return, 10 signs of Christ's return, the sign of global travel, the sign of global explosion of knowledge, Tuesday, the sign of global weather gone wild, telecommunication and television, the sign of global evangelism, the sign of global pestilences on Wednesday. See, that's a five minute read each of the days. So Wednesday, this is what you'd read. The sign of global tracking and positioning, the sign of weapons of mass destruction, the sign of the return of the wandering Jews, the sign of Israel in Ezekiel. And then I go through the steps to eternity and let me show you how this ends. The last day on Saturday of week three, wise investments, how to lay up treasure in heaven. You see, prophecy was written not to scare us, not to make us spend all day long following the news. We already know what's going to happen. The outline has been given to us. That's what Jesus' whole sermon's about. But look at this. How do you invest in heaven? Be investing. Lay up treasures in heaven. Jesus collects all your prayers, so pray to him. Jesus multiplies sacrificial gifts, so give to him. Jesus counts the souls you lead to him, so win lost ones to him. Jesus remembers humble service, so serve him. Jesus loves missionaries, so do outreach and go for him. Those are the ways that we invest in heaven. Real quickly, let me take you to the center of Living Hope, week 22. I love this section because part of my goal in writing this book was to give people a summary of all the 800 prophetic allusions to the rest of the Bible that are in the book of Revelation. So week 22 is seeing Christ prophesied from Genesis to Daniel. Then week 23 is from Hosea to Micah. In other words, uh, on Sunday, Hosea says, worship our God of faithfulness in week 23. Monday, Joel says, worship our God of wrath. Tuesday, Amos says, worship our God of justice. So it's a summary. Each day you, you get to summarize and see the content of an entire book of the Bible. On, on Wednesday, Obadiah says, worship our God of humility. Thursday, Jonah says, worship our God of mercy. On Friday, Micah says, worship our God of righteousness. And then on Saturday, I summarize that whole section of the Minor Prophets. The next week, week 24, see Christ in the Old Testament, Nahum to Malachi. Nahum says, worship our God of judgment. Habakkuk says, worship our God of sovereignty. Zephaniah says, worship our God of hope. Haggai says, worship our God of sacrifice. Zechariah says, worship our God who jealously seeks our attention. God wants us to pay attention to him. And Malachi, the last of the minor prophets, says, worship the God who wants our first love, just like in Revelation. And then on Saturday of that week, I talk about how to finish life fruitfully for the Lord. Now, for us this week, this is the chapter that ties to Matthew 24. It's chapter, or it's week 26. It's called Understanding Christ's Wrath. It goes through all of the seals of Revelation 6, the horrors of Christ's wrath, all of his warnings. I do a tour of the grave and talk about uh, where people are after death, the, the uh, saved and the lost. And then I end with this. This is my favorite funeral message. I included it in this devotional. Uh, life is fragile. Death is inevitable. Christ is the answer, and this is why we should be living in hope. God has given us a conclusion of human history. God has given us a job to do while he's away. 
He's given us a way to stay in touch with him and he's opened an investment account for us in heaven. And then in week 31, it's Revelation 11, God's plan of the ages. That's where I cover how Matthew 24 and this whole outline dovetails into the prophet Daniel, Jesus' favorite Old Testament prophet about prophecy. And then the final chapter I just want to share with you is week 38, how to live for eternity. And in, on Friday of week 38, I have probably the most challenging uh, part of this whole book. It's how to know if you're a worldly person or a heavenly minded person. Worldly means I'm living for here. Heavenly minded says I'm living for there. A worldly person's identity is found in the world, not in heaven. A worldly person finds escape through amusements, entertainments, and pleasure seeking. A worldly person uses work, career, and accomplishments. Even daily life is a way out of spiritual responsibilities. They say, I don't have time. A worldly person is tied to technology, science, and knowledge of this world, not of the next. In other words, they know more about movies and music and games and social media than they know about God's word. And on and on I go through this until finally I talk about on Saturday of week 38, Living for Heaven, the seven keys to contentment. Remember, things are only temporary. Only seek necessities. Wait for the rest. Avoid a consuming desire for prosperity. Flee materialism. Cling to eternal life. Fix your hope on God. Give until it hurts. Make a choice to live in hope. I strongly commend to you this book. Ten years of my life studying the Bible that's been made into a five minute a day, daily dose, year long journey through the book of Revelation. I hope that you'll consider if you want to understand Bible prophecy, if you want to understand current events, if you want to know the framework that Jesus gave for human history, this book is a great challenge. Take a year long challenge, spend five minutes a day reading these daily devotionals, and reading the little verses that are assigned for each day. And I can assure you, it will be transformational. Jesus said in verse two, do you not see all these things, Matthew 24, two? Assuredly, I say to you, what? What does it say in verse two? Of all the buildings of the temple, Jesus said not even one stone is going to still be mortared and sitting blocks, like cement blocks. He said none of those big blocks are going to be left of the temple. And guess what? You'll find when we're on the other side, when we go through there, you're, you're going to sit on a pile of the stones from the temple that the Romans pried they didn't just pry the whole temple and all the buildings. They started taking the courses of stones and they took them down until they were too big to move, until they got to the hundreds of tons level and they couldn't pry them anymore. But every surface stone of the temple, of every stack stone, of every building, they completely pried and tipped over. When we sit over there, I consider that the single for all people to see the single greatest proof of scripture because Jesus said that 40 years before it happened. It would be like me saying in 2000, if I just stood in front of the World Trade Center and said, every drop of this is gonna to crumble to the ground and a huge cloud of dust is gonna come, people would have looked at me and said, you are absolutely crazy. Now, if I'd have done that on film in the year 2000, right? And it happened in 2001, you would have said I was a what? Prophet. Jesus said in A.D. 30, when that thing was one of the wonders of the world, he said, there won't be two stones of this thing on top of each other. And the disciples went, what are you? They said, he doesn't, I don't think he means it's figurative, you know. Forty years later, how many years? 40. What is 40? Yeah, they had a 40-year period that they 
could have done something and they just increased their exclusivity and shutting people out. And the Lord says, I'm done with you temporarily. We believe there's yet a future. So, verse 3, they're sitting here and the disciples are saying, hey, could you, if all this is going to fall out, what else is going to happen? If, you, if all those buildings are going to fall down, what else is going to happen? And they said, what will be the sign of your coming, verse 3? The sign. So, so what chapter 24 is, are the signs of the end. He ascended from here, he's returning here, and he gave his predictions of the future here. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, you have told us to ask for your illumination of your spirit, and we do. We ask you to open our eyes to behold wonderful things, and there are wonderful things before us in this 24th chapter. Just give us the blessing of reading these words now, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.